taught us. How many of you can think about all the things your mom taught you when you were a little child? Well, I, I know most of you know my mother. Most of you know her. And she's just a frail, feeble little thing. But let me tell you, she wasn't always frail and feeble. <laughs> 35, 40 years ago, she was feisty just like every mother. She has a little bit of that in her. And, uh, but some of the things that I was thinking about that my mother taught me, and I'm sure that you may be able to share in some of these, my mother taught me to appreciate a job well done. She would say to me, if you're finished, if you're going to kill each other, with my brother and I, if you're going to kill each other, do it outside, I just finished cleaning. <laughs> my mother taught me about religion. She said, you better pray that comes out of the carpet. <laughs> she taught me about time travel. She said, if you don't straighten up, I'm going to knock you into the middle of next week. My mother taught me about logic. She said, because I said so, that's why. She taught me about foresight. She said, make sure you wear clean underwear, just in case you're in an accident. How many of your mothers taught you that? <laughs> See, you guys are all laughing because they're not funny, because they're true. See, you've heard them before. My mother taught me about irony. Just keep laughing, and I'll give you something to cry about. <laughs> My mother taught me about the science of osmosis. Shut your mouth and eat your supper. How, how does that work? I don't know. My mother taught me about contortionism. Will you just look at the dirt on the back of your neck? My mother taught me about the circle of life. She said, I brought you into this world. I can take you out. <laughs> My mother taught me about behavior modification. She said, stop acting like your father. And my mother taught me about envy. She said, there are millions of less fortunate children in this world who don't have wonderful parents like you do. And of course, I would say, show me them, please. <laughs> please. Ah, that was my mother, some things about my mom. You laugh because they're true. You've heard many of them in your lifetime. But you know what? As we grow older, as, 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 we, as, we're given, as we're brought into this life and we're given life as a young child and we mature and we grow up, our mothers take on different, uh, point, different points of view from, from a child's standpoint. And I know I've shared this maybe several years ago in regards to Father's Day, but I know about the age of four years old, my mommy can't do anything. I'm sorry, my mommy can do anything at the age of four. At the age of eight years of age, my mom knows a lot. She doesn't know everything, but she knows a whole lot. By the age of 12, my mother really doesn't know quite everything. By the age of 14, mom, duh, really? By the age of 16, my mom, she's like, not so cool. By the age of 18, that old woman, she's way out of touch. By the age of 25, you say, well, she might know a little bit about that. By the age of 35, before we decide, we ought to get mom's opinion. By the age of 45, I wonder what mom thinks about this. And by the age 65, we say, I wish I could talk it over with my mom. There's a lot of truth to that, too. It, takes a, it goes through a cycle of life. I listened to testimonies last night here at the Mother-Daughter Banquet. I have, have the privilege every year of actually coming over here and running the sound for the program. And I got to listen last night young girls share about their mother. I got to listen to a, a young girl stand up and tell her mother, I don't treat you and respect you the way I should. I don't appreciate you as often as I should. I don't tell you the things that I need to say to you as often as I should. And I listened to other young girls share with their mother about the influence and the impact that she has had on their lives. And in fact, there wasn't a dry eye in here last night. 
I listened to a devotional time by Joyce Gabrielson. I learned a lot about Joyce last night, things that I didn't know. But she shared a mother's devotional, a mother's testimony, a Mother's Day devotional from from the viewpoint of a daughter, a mother-in-law, and a mom in her life. And it was powerful. This morning I want to share with you a message entitled, Rewarded for Raising Children, Moms. Moms. Say, dads are off the hook. They can sleep. No, you can't, dads. Because if you do, I'll call you out. No, I'm just kidding. But, uh, But dads, this is for you too. But today we celebrate moms. We thank God for our moms. And we're going to look in the Bible today in the Old Testament, back in the book of Exodus. We're going to look at a mother, just in brief today, a mother who was rewarded for raising her children, her child. We're going to turn to Exodus chapter 2. We're going to read the the first 10 verses. And we have an interesting story in our text today where a mother is paid for taking care of her own child. In Exodus chapter 2, and you know the story, most of you do, I'm sure. In Exodus chapter 2, in verse 1, the Bible reads, And there went a man, that man was Amran, Amran, of the house of Levi. Levi was a priestly tribe. And he took, a, he took to a wife, he took, took wife a daughter of the Levi, of Levi, of the same tribe. Well, that lady's name was Jochebed. It says, And the woman conceived and bare a son, and that son was Moses. And when she saw him, that he was a goodly or beautiful child, she hid him three months. And when when she could no longer hide him, She took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein and she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. And his sister, that's Moses' sister Miriam, stood afar off to to wit what would be done to him, to Moses. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along the river's side. And when she saw the ark coming, she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him, and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. And said his sister, this is Miriam, this is what Miriam said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call unto thee a nurse of the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for thee? And don't miss what happened in verse 7. Miriam, Moses' sister, Jochebed's daughter, realized, knew who that was, and went to Pharaoh's daughter and says, Hey, I know a nurse. I know a nurse. We need need to get a handmaid to take care of him. And she goes and she gets the boy's mom. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother, Jochebed. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee wages, thee thy wages. I will give thee your payment. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son, and she called his name Moses. And she said, because I drew him out of the water. Now keep your finger there and turn clean back to the other end of the Bible in Hebrews. And look at Hebrews chapter 11. And look at verse 23 to verse 27. Supporting text of Exodus chapter 2. He says, by faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw He was a proper, he was a beautiful child. And they were not afraid of the king's commandments. See, Pharaoh had said that any child under the age of two, any male child under the age of two was to be thrown into the river and drowned. 
That's why they hid the boy. Verse 24 says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. How tempting that would have been. To not to be a Hebrew, but to be considered part, an Egyptian, part of, of Herod's family with wealth and riches. Choosing rather to suffer affliction, verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. In verse 28, don't have it, I don't think, on your screen, it says, Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch him. And you know the story of Moses from that point on. But here is an interesting picture, an interesting story in our text where a mother is paid for taking care of her own child. And I want you to know this this morning, moms, that you will be rewarded for raising your children. Maybe not like Jochebed was, essentially. But wonderful blessings from God will flow to each one of us who does our part with the children whom God gave us. Last night, I experienced that, Jen. I watched that firsthand in your life. And you as a mom should have received those rewards last night when your children stood up and shared about the kind of mother and the impact and the influence that you've had in their lives. I got to see that. And if you were a mom here or a daughter here last evening, you got to witness Jen's rewards. It was a blessing. You will be compensated and rewarded for raising your children. But ladies and gentlemen, as we read our text this morning, I want to share with you three things that I've pulled out of this text and the first thing is that there, there, in the life of a mom, there has to be a planning stage. There has to be a plan or a planning stage. In the first four, verse, uh, first four verses of this text, when we look at Jochebed's life, it says, And there went a man, Amran, of the house of Levi, a godly man, of, of, the, of the priestly tribe of Israel. And he took to wife a daughter, Jochebed, of Levi, of the same tribe, and the woman conceived and bare a son, and when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could not longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes, and she daubed it with slime and with pitch, and put the child therein, and she laid him in the flags, laid it in the flags by the river's brink, and his sister Miriam stood afar off to wit what would be done unto him. There is a plan here. And the plan was this, part of the plan, the first part of the plan is this, that Jochebed, Jochebed, the mother of Moses, Jochebed planned, planned to be a godly mother. She planned it. She wasn't born that way. None of us are born that way. She didn't all of a sudden become godly through osmosis. She determined in her heart, she decided that that's what she was going to be. She was born into the house of Levi. The Levites were a priestly tribe. Her dad was a Levi, a Levite. And she married a man who was a Levite. She planned to be a godly woman, a daughter of Levi. Now she was a daughter of Levi, so think about her upbringing. She was rooted and grounded in the scriptures. She was taught the things of God as a young woman, as a young child, growing up in this tribe. Of all the tribes, the 12 tribes, Benjamin was a good tribe. And Levi, Levi and Benjamin were probably the two best. But her upbringing, at a young age she was molded and she was shaped. You know, and I was thinking that this scripture that came to mind for me, um, really, and I'm not taking it out of context, but I want to use part of it, but in Peter's uh, epistle in Second Peter, I'm sorry, in First Peter chapter 3, if you want to look there, I want to show you something. 
when I think about the heart of a mom. Now, I got to tell you, my wife was this woman in 1 Peter chapter 3. She was the 1 Peter chapter 3 woman. I want us to look at the first four verses, but I'm not going to look at this in the context necessarily for the husband's standpoint, but from the mother's standpoint and how it will affect not just the husband, but it will affect the children. Peter writes to the mothers here, and he says, he says, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. If, if, if any obey not the word, that was me, that they may also, without the word, be won by the conversation of their wives. That was my wife. While they behold, now, now look at this picture we get in verse 2, 3, and 4. While they, the husbands, behold your chaste conversation, couple, your manner of life coupled with fear, he says, he says, he says, who's adorning, let it not be the outward adorning of plating of the hair and of the wearing of gold or of the putting on of apparel. It's not so much what you look like on the outside, but he says here, but let it be the hidden man of the heart. Mothers, let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God a great price. Mothers, one of the things that I can remember about my mom is the meek and quiet spirit. I know I share things with you and we laugh, but my mom was meek and quiet. I learned a lot from my mother. Not because she was an ogre, not because she was a tyrant, not because she was a bully, because she was meek. Meekness doesn't mean weakness. Meekness is strength under control. My mom was a meek mom. When I see that picture in 1 Peter chapter 3, I wonder how many of our moms today are meek but, or, or, or more worried about what they look like on the outside but rather than who they are on the inside, not just to their husbands that are without the word, but what about to their children? You know, our children don't belong to us. They belong to God. They're gifts from heaven. And this, this daughter here, the Jochebed, was a daughter of a Levite. Her, she had a, an incredible upbringing in the things of the Lord. That was predominant in her life. There was a plan. She planned to be a godly woman. She married a man. This was a plan. She married a man. She wasn't hunted down with a, with a spear or an arrow and said, hey, you've got to marry this guy. She married a man from the tribe of Levi, the priestly tribe. She was sought out, no doubt. And she responded to a man of the tribe of Levi. And now look, this was a big step for her. <laughs> I'm growing up as a young woman, being taught the things of God by my dad and by my mom. And now, I'm going to marry a man just like my dad. I'm going to marry a man, a godly man. She's made a decision. She's made, she has planned in her mind that she's going to live a life for the Lord. She has planned that. Her desire was to be a godly woman. Of all the tribes, the tribe of Levi, she chose that. She planned that. The Bible says in verse 2 here of our text in Exodus, it says, the woman conceived and bare a son, and when she saw him that he was goodly or beautiful, a beautiful child, she hid him three months. In Hebrews chapter 11, we read that she was not afraid of the king's orders. That's the point here. She married a man from the tribe of Levi, and she was not afraid of the king. The Bible tells you and I that it is so much better for you and I to obey God than it is to obey man. She didn't care what the king said. She didn't care what Pharaoh said. This was her gift. This was a gift from God. What was going to happen? I, I turned my, my three-month-old child over to Pharaoh. He's going to have my child drowned in the river. She hid her son. She didn't care what the king said. She understood that, that children are a gift from God. She didn't give him up. She did what I believe God told her to do. And folks, this took planning. She hid that boy. She hid that boy, and when the time was right, she planned an ark. She planned an ark. It says there, and when she could no longer hide him, 
she took for him an ark of bulrushes and she daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein and she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. She planned to raise a godly child. She hid this boy in, in uh, she, she planned an ark. She planned it. I hid him. And when she could no longer hide him anymore, she planned an ark. The bulrushes, the pitch, the slime. Just like it took God's plan. God's plan. To have Noah build an ark. Did God give Noah a plan? He sure did. God gave Noah a plan. To build an ark and to save mankind. That took planning. It took planning to save Jesus from Herod. Whenever Herod wanted to kill Jesus as a young baby, it took planning. It took a plan, folks, and it took a plan here. Jochebed planned to be a godly woman. She married, she was a daughter of Levi. She married a man from the tribe of Levi. She wasn't afraid of the king. She planned to raise godly children. She hid the child, which took a plan. She planned the ark. It takes planning to help raise our kids and our grandchildren today. Many moms get their plan from the Lord, and so did Moses' mother. Mom, what plans are you making today? Mom, what plans are you making? Are you making godly plans for your children? Grandparents, are you making godly plans for your children and grandchildren? Do you desire God's aspirations? Do you desire God's best for your children and grandchildren? What are your aspirations? Are they what Joshua says to the families in Joshua 24, verse 15? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You may say, you know what, but my aspirations for my child is to raise a professional athlete. That's okay. They can still serve Jesus while being pro-athletes. That's fine. But what tends to happen in raising our children, especially I use pro professional athletes today because it's prominent. Everybody wants their child to be the best. And everybody wants it to be the best of the best. But many times what happens, maybe God has a better plan for them than being a professional athlete. Many times that I find, and I use sports because it's predominant in sports today, many parents want to live their life through their children because they didn't. And that's not good. The Bible says that we're to train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Every child has a God-given gift. Are we pointing our kids to do God's best? Are we putting our aspirations? It's okay to have aspirations. It's not wrong to have aspirations. It's not wrong to have desires for your children. It's not wrong to have desires for your grandchildren. It's not wrong. But are we seeking God's best for our kids? What plans are you making? Are you a godly mother? Are your plans godly plans? That's the planning, folks. That's the planning. I want to look at the second thing here this morning, and it is, I called it the, the protection or the security, the protection, we'll call it. The protection that, that, that was required for raising children. If you look at verse 3, and we did read it once, but look at verse 3 of our text. It says, and when she could no longer hide him. When she could no longer hide hide him the security the protection that's provided our kids Jochebed provided protection for Moses and she did that through bonding bonding when she could hide him no longer hide him she hid him <laughs> she held him as close as she possibly could how many of you moms in here today have held your children today? How many of you have put your arms around them and drew them close to you today? How many of you grandparents have had the opportunity 
to hold your children and grandchildren close to you today. She held Moses as close as she possibly could. She hid him for three months. I don't think she just shoved him in a corner and left him go there. She embraced him and she did everything she could to protect him. She held him as close as she could. Every parent needs to do this. Do you understand the security that a child experiences whenever you hold him close? <laughs> I gave my grandson last night, I was holding him during the, uh, the Mother's Day dinner, and I gave him to Polly's sister. Well, Oliver never met Polly's sister in his life, and she never met Oliver. But she wanted to hold him, so I took him and I gave him to her. I turned my back, and I heard, Jeff, Jeff, Jeff. And he was back there going like this. He, he wanted to come back. He wanted to come back. Yeah, he's a pappy's boy. But a child needs security. The child needs to feel loved. And Jochebed made Moses feel secure through bonding. He was secure through bonding. He was, he was uh, secure He felt protected. Look at the second part of verse 3. It says here, and she took for him, and when she could no longer hide him, then it says she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch. She protected him not only through bonding, not only through holding him close and letting him know that, that he's near and dear to her, she protected him by the ark. By the ark. You say, what, what, what do you mean? She built a place of safety for Moses. She built a place of safety. What was the ark that Noah built? That was a place of rescue. That was a place of salvation. That was a place to save all mankind. It was a place of protection against the elements. The world was going to be destroyed by water, by a flood. She protected Moses. By the ark. She built a place of safety. She built an ark. She built, she built him a foundation. She built him a, a nest of, of protection. She built him a hedge of protection to give that child the very best. And you and I do that. We do that through the process of years of our life. Whether you know it or not, you and I are building a platform. For our children, we're building a platform for our grandchildren so that they can make it whenever they're let go, whenever they're set sail. What kind of platform, what kind of ark are you providing for your child? What kind of platform, what kind of ark are you building for your grandchild? Moses was protected through the bonding of his mother. Moses was protected by the ark. And Moses, look at the verse part of verse 3. And she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein, inside it. And she laid it, the ark, in the flags by the river's brink. He was protected through bonding. He was protected by the ark. And he was protected by the boat. Now, that's hard for some to do. It's hard for some of us. A boat is something that's going to set sail, folks. She put Moses in this ark. She put Moses in this boat, knowing that it was going to go down the river. Let me ask you something this morning. How many of you had difficulties or find it difficult to let your children go? Many of you. Many of you. It's hard for some to do to let go and say fly. It's hard to do to let go and, and say set sail. But this is why it's so important for you and I to start early with the, the lives of our children. It's so important for us to start while they're young, to have them in church, and to be the example, to show them Jesus. And it's really hard if we haven't prepared them right 
And I believe we've hurt them by not preparing them. The Bible tells us, and this is not the case in every situation, but the, the Bible makes it clear that, that therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. I believe this is God's plan for how, how we are to go on after a good preparation at home. It doesn't always happen. Sometimes it takes longer than others. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 22, verse 6, it says, Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he will rebel and curse you. No, it's not what it says. It says he will not depart from it. If it's done right, folks, look at the outcome. If it train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart. Even if they rebel, I believe they'll come back because you've planned for them and you've protected them. Well, let's jump down to verse 9 of our text, and let's look at the reward. The plan, the planning process, the, the protection, the security process, and then the reward in verse 9. It says, And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages and the woman took the child and she nursed it that's right Jochebed got paid to raise her own son she got paid folks it pays to do the right thing it pays to do the right thing not that you will be perfect but it pays to have your heart bent towards doing what God desires, not just for your children, but every aspect of your life. She got paid to raise her son. And I want you to know something, this too. If you're here this morning and you're a parent, you can't do this unless it's done right. And I say right. Well, if you're here this morning and you're a parent and you're not saved, you need to get saved. You can't raise your child in a godly home if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning and you're a parent and you're not right with God, you are a Christian, but you're not right, you need to get right. So parents, you need to get saved, you need to get right. We need to do things God's way. The Bible tells us that we're to raise our children in the nurture and in the admonition of the Lord. We, you and I should nurture our children. And that's not baby our children, but nurture them. Nurture them. I want you to look at the, 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 the wages in the life, the, the, her wages, Jockeybed's wages in the life of, for raising Moses. And all parents receive wages. And Jen, you experienced some of them last night. I believe you did. Jeanette, you did too from your daughter. And there were others that shared. Those are rewards. Those are rewards. God's not going to give you a $20 bill or a $100 bill. You don't want that anyways, because those types of things fly away. What you heard last night will last as long as God gives you a mind, won't it? Those are eternal things. You can't take them away. You can go flush $20 down your gas tank and it's gone. But what you heard last night will remain forever. Look at the rewards, the Jochebed. Look at, back in Hebrews chapter 11 and look at verse 24. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 24. It says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, when he, when he aged and became old enough, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. That's a reward. He stayed true to the things that he was taught as a young boy, as a young man, things that his mother had instilled in him. Money and wealth and prosperity were not one of them. That's not what drove his life. That was a reward. Look at verse 25. It says, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God, the Hebrew people. He stayed with his people choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, 
Not only did he refuse to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, he chose pain over pleasure. Oh. Look at verse 26. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches. He saw the reproach of Christ as greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. He, not only did he refuse to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, not only did he choose pain over pleasure, but he chose the reproach of Jesus Christ. In verse 27, it says, By faith he forsook Egypt. He left Egypt. Not fearing the wrath of the king. For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Folks, he left Egypt. Moses could have had a lavished lifestyle. He could have been, he could have had, he could have had everything and anything he wanted. But the rewards that Jochebed experienced were the, were the truths and the foundations lived out in this man's life that she instilled in him as a young boy. She trained up a child in the way that he should go, and when he was old, he did not depart from it. This verse of Scripture speaks near and dear to my heart. In John's epistles, John's third epistle, the Bible says this, in John, 3 John chapter 1, in verse 4, 3 John verse 4 says this, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Moms and dads this morning, what sort of planning are you developing for your children? Grandparents, what sort of planning are you developing for your grandchildren? Are you making godly plans for them? Do you desire God's best for them or do you desire your best for them? Are you providing a level of security and protection for your children? Or are you holding them close? Are you building a nest of protection, a hedge of protection, all along building a platform for them to set sail on? If so, there's no doubt in my mind that you're receiving some sort of reward in your life for doing that. I pray that that's your desire today with your children. God will reward you for doing what's right. God will reward us for doing His will, His way. Listen, God's best is always the best. Even above our own wants and desires, God's best. God has given us moms, God has given you a great gift, raising your child. Last night, Jeanette said there's probably not a, not a, not a more uh, distinguished job, responsibility for a mother than to raise her children. But not only to raise them, but to raise them the way God desires them to be raised. Do you need help this morning? We all do. We all do. I pray you'd look to God for direction in raising your children and raising your grandchildren. And I know, through the scriptures, just like he did with Jochebed, he will reward you. Would you stand with me this morning?